ever receive that product again. Another product that's available uh, specific to our dogs is uh, canine lifefulized albumin. This is an expensive product and we did see it on the market for a short period of time. We did have it in our hospital. Uh, it's no longer, as far as I know, readily available. I called around just as early as a couple of months ago. There are no actual studies right now to support its use. So again, it more, I think, depends on clinician preference and experience. It's stored refrigerated and when you are needing to use it, it uh, you reconstitute it for use. Oops, that's up the point. So the cross match. So again, the cross match is done to help predict whether or not um, you may have a transfusion reaction between a donor and a recipient. And the goal is to do this before you actually administer the blood. I, you know, as, as we'll kind of go into a little bit, um, a little bit later, some of the specific reactions, but some of the reactions could be life-threatening. And so if there's time warranting, obviously it makes sense to try to test the blood beforehand to make sure that it's compatible. Uh, so in general, we try to do a cross-match uh, before we give uh, animal blood to any patient, uh, specifically red cells, whether it be red blood cells uh, packed or whole blood. In some situations, obviously, uh, there may not be time to do the cross-match. Uh, and that's when the clinician has to decide, is the risk of transfusing this patient and uh, having a transfusion reaction more than, uh, you know, waiting to, to actually cross-match the blood? And there are certainly times where we have had to go ahead and just administer blood, and thankfully it's worked out. Cross-match does not predict how long the red blood cells are going to survive in the animal. And it does not el el sorry, eliminate the risk of blood transfusion reactions uh, related to white cell reactions, uh, plasma protein reactions. And again, it does not, predict the, uh, does not predict if there will be a delayed transfusion reaction. In general, the cross match, there, um, there's kind of two terms that we, uh, we hear. There's the major cross match, which essentially is taking uh, serum from the recipient, so the, the animals that's going to receive the blood products, and red blood cells from the donor. And there's a couple of different ways of, of managing those, and we'll kind of go into that a little bit later. And then the minor cross match is uh, the mixing the donor serum with the recipient red blood cells to look for incompatibilities. So there's essentially um, kind of three different methods for cross-matching. Uh, there's a gel test or gel agglutination test. There's a tube agglutination test. And there's also a slide agglutination test. And to date, there's been no kind of veterinary studies, studies specifically geared towards differentiating uh, which is more beneficial, uh, the cross-matching by a tube or the gel agglutination method. Um, with our patients, it can be certainly more challenging to cross-match them if they do have disease processes that um, increase their hemolysis uh, in their blood uh, or reasons for rouleau or agglutination. Tube agglutination, uh, these are these um, you may have seen by Rapid Vet is an example of a, a company that has them. Uh, if you've had experience working in emergency practice, but they're actually um, tubes, little tubes with the, that contain gel that you can actually uh, do cross matches. And so the benefit of these ones are, oh sorry, back up. <laughs> the two agglutination ones are, um, are when you do a major and minor cross match and essentially you incubate the two, uh, the two blood products together and look for a visible reaction. And these ones you have to have some clinical knowledge of because and, and knowing how to interpret them. And so they're usually best done by people that have had experience uh, doing these types of cross-match. And again, as with we indicated earlier, there's a major, a minor cross-match, and also auto-controls to make sure that the way you've set up your cross-match is, uh, is accurate. The slide agglutination test is probably the most uh, familiar I am uh, with doing cross matches. Um, but again, it requires people that have had experience uh, doing these cross matches and are generally reserved for kind of more emergency situations. 
um, basically you have four slides that are prepared and you are doing a major cross match. So your recipient serum and your donor red cells, you have a slide with your minor cross match um, with your your donor serum and uh, recipient red cells, and then also your controls. And basically, uh, it's just as it explains, is you're putting a drop of, of, of serum and a drop of red cells and some saline, and you're observing for agglutination on the cells to indicate that this transfusion is going to be incompatible, incompatible if you administer it to the animal. Uh, and again, this is kind of where, again, where experience comes into place because there is, I mean, these slides are pretty clear as to uh, which one's Rouleau and which one's agglutination, if you're familiar with those things. But certainly animals that um, have clinical illness, it can be hard to differentiate sometimes between Rouleau and agglutination. And there's certainly techniques that, with experience, that you learned uh, to do to help differentiate between those two. But essentially, it's really important to be able to differentiate because you could be calling a uh, transfusion incompatible, and truly it is compatible. Uh, I put uh, this book up here because um, I'm not. I didn't want to go into the specifics of all of exactly how to do all those um, cross matches, because I think that it's a, a huge topic that again you need to make sure that you understand thoroughly. This is the book that I, my Bible that I refer to whenever I'm doing cross matches. Um, it gives step by step procedures on how to do either the slide method or the tube agglutination method. And so I'd refer you to th this book by Carol Matthews if you have interest. Certainly uh, a lot of the blood banks, like the larger blood banks that do uh, sell blood products, they do also have information on how to do in-house cross matches as well too, and you can certainly seek information from them. Another method that you uh, may have be familiar with uh, is the gel tests. And these are available for both canines and felines. Uh, it only tests uh, the major cross match. Uh, it requires less expertise. Basically, uh, there's a formula for um, mixing up the bloods, and you're looking for a reaction inside of a tube. So it doesn't require as much expertise in looking under a microscope and evaluating whether or not there's agglutination or rouleau or other things happening. Right now, there's two commercially available products that I'm aware of. Uh, one is by Rapid Vet, which is a, a company in the States, which also makes the blood typing cards that we discussed earlier. And then another company is Diamed, which is a company based out of Switzerland as well. And here's just, uh, here's just some pictures of the actual uh, tests. So administering blood products, there are just some general guidelines. Um, there's specific protocols for individual products. The rate of transfusion, um, the protocols for administering the blood filters that you utilize uh, are specific to the different products you're using. So if your hospital does utilize any of these blood products, I would recommend that either you look it up and you could... Again, Carol Matthews is a great reference for all the, uh, the blood products available. Uh, a lot of the blood banks do supply you with details of each of the individual blood products if you do ask them on how to transfuse them. As a general rule for all of the blood products, though, they should not be warm to more than 37 degrees. And this is really important because if you do, you take the risk of um, damaging red cells if you're warming red blood cells. You can also uh, denature proteins and affect clotting factors as well, too. So it's really important to to make sure that you don't warm it past 37 degrees. Blood products should be administered via a dedicated IV line. And it's really important to ensure that you don't administer other medications while giving a blood transfusion. Uh, I mean, there's so many medications that we have, uh, you know, it's impossible to know exactly which blood products, or sorry, which medications will react with what, with what, bleh. let me try again, <laughs> oops. Uh, with wet blood products, and but certainly some of the reactions that we could see is lysis of the red blood cells. Uh, there's some medications that will precipitate in the blood, and there's some that will actually affect the coagulation of the red, of the uh, blood products and actually generate a clot. Uh, administration should always contain uh, a filter. So whenever you're giving blood products, uh, they should always have a filter on that. And there is actually uh, specifically designed. Uh, blood filters for administering blood products. These are the two most common ones that we utilize. Um, 
one, uh, the one on the bottom right is a 170 micrometer pore filter and is commonly used for administering most blood products. The one in the upper left, uh, the trade name of that is called a hemonate filter and that's a much smaller uh, filter and it's about 40 to 15 micron pores in it. When you're using the small one, it's important to know that these will actually get clogged, clogged up with all the products that they're filling out, or sorry, filtering out, and should be changed ideally about every 50 mils. The bottom one on the right, you could utilize that for the whole entire transfusion. There are some filters which we don't traditionally uh, utilize at our hospital, hospital, but there are some blood filters that actually have a leukocyte reduction filters in them. They generally tend to be more expensive, uh, but as we kind of look into transfusion reactions a little bit later on, uh, there are some situations where it's ideal to remove those white cells as well. IV fluids containing calcium should not be administered with blood products, so LRS bad, no LRS with uh, transfusions. Uh, it can lead to thrombus formation because of the interaction with the calcium and the citrate. As mentioned earlier, no IV medications during transfusion. Administered blood products should be given over a period of, or sorry, not over a period, within four to six hours. If it looks like you are, for whatever reason, the veterinarian has uh, decided to give the transfusion for longer this, than this, uh, what we generally do is put a spike in the unit of blood, if it is in a, a unit, versus syringes, as you can see kind of in the bottom right corner there, and we'll sample off aliquots of what we want to give uh, the animal, and what we do with the rest of the unit is keep it refrigerated. And the reason this is important is because it can increase your, your bacterial load if there's any sort of ca uh, contamination. Uh, so we want to keep that unit cool if you're going to be stretching out that unit for more than four hours. And obviously patient monitoring is extremely important. Again, we'll kind of go over uh, some reactions to watch for, but um, some of them are extremely life-threatening. So it's really important as AHTs that we're watching our patients really closely to observe for, for any reactions. And this is just one of our uh, transfusion logs that we utilize at our hospital. So as you can see, we do a pre-examination uh, of our animals, and then we monitor them every 15 minutes. We usually start off at about a quarter a mil per kilo of blood and then work our way up to the, the dose uh, that we're going to give over four to six hours. And I see I'm running closer out of time, so I'll be a little bit quicker. Uh, transfusion reactions, we see they're kind of grouped into different categories. Uh, we see immuno immunologic and non-immunologic reactions, as well as acute versus delayed. I'm going to kind of go over them. I don't think you need to memorize whether, where they fit into these categories, but for me, I like to know kind of, I need to know more to be able to understand what I'm seeing in my patient and to know what to look for. And I think as HTs, we don't need to diagnose whether they're having an acute, you know, hemolytic reaction, but I think we're important members of the teams to be able to alert the veterinarians as to what's happening and, and be able to uh, key into what we're looking for. Most importantly, if you ever see any reaction or you have any concern uh, when administering blood products is to stop the transfusion, first and foremost. You can kind of look at other things later, but the most important thing is to stop the transfusion. Don't discard the blood until everything is kind of settled because it may be that after observing a reaction, the blood unit needs to be more examined closely to look for either bacterial contamination or to confirm that it's actually the correct unit. You may want to do further cross-matches on that unit that has potentially caused a reaction. Uh, 